Daniel chapter 2. Have you ever gone to bed and your eyes are wide open and you just have a kind of a spirit of restlessness? You lay there and you lay there and you lay there and you can't go to sleep. Your mind won't cut off. And so you think about just getting up. Excuse me. i got to turn myself on. There we go. Is that good? Okay. Uh, you know about uh, all kinds of things. Your mind just won't shut off. There seems to be a spirit of restlessness. Well, when we come to this second chapter of the book of Daniel, we find that kind of restlessness that uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has experienced. We've seen it once before in the Bible, uh, in the book of Esther, where Ahasuerus couldn't sleep, and so they call he called for the books to be uh, brought to him, and he read about uh, Mordecai and how Mordecai uh, uncovered the uh, plot that was against him to take the king's life. And so as he read about this, then it was, it was the will of God that this would take place. God was in his restlessness uh, as, he read the, as he read this story about Mordecai and so he calls Naaman in, and Naaman, of course, hated Mordecai, and he hated the Jews, and he wanted the Jews to be annihilated because of their, uh, because they're refusing to bow down to him as one of the leaders. And so Ahasuerus says to Mordecai, if I was going to honor somebody uh, for the greatness that they have performed, what would you suggest that I do? He said, well, I would put them on a white steed I would dress them with one of the great robes of the king and I would take one of the leaders of the king's palace and march them around the city <laughs> announcing who they were. And so Naaman did not understand that he was talking about Mordecai. And so uh, the king says, okay, that's what we're going to do then. I'm going to ask you to get Mordecai, place him on a big white, one of my white horses, dress him up in one of the king's robes and then I want you to lead him around the city announcing who he is and what he has done for the life of the king. So God does use restlessness from time to time to give us a word. So when we're in the bed and we can't sleep, it may be that God wants to say something to us. Amen? Or it could be that he has a dream for us to dream and he wants to say something to us through that dream. Well, let's look at Daniel chapter 2, looking at verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summons the, music the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. So here we find that Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. But the problem is, he can't remember what that dream was. But the other problem is that he is really upset about what this dream was and he knew that there was some special meaning to this dream and he needed to know what the dream was. Now, look at me for just a minute. How many of you have ever dreamed something in the night and you woke up in the morning and you pondered over the fact of what you dreamed that night but you can't remember it to save your life? I've done that with a few sermons. <laughs> I had the I preach the best sermons sometimes in my sleep, and when I wake up, I'm thinking, now what did I preach? But uh, anyway, so Nebuchadnezzar had gone to sleep, and he had dreamed this dream, and then whenever he woke up, he couldn't dream, couldn't sleep. He was just so restless, and so he was so restless that he called all of his magicians and enchanters and sorcerers. And all of these people that were supposed to have supernatural powers to be able to tell what he had dreamed. And so he was asking really something impossible to do for these enchanters, musicians, magicians, and sorcerers. And so look at verse 4. Then the astrologers answered 
the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Well, this didn't set very well with the king, and the king told him in verse 5, the king replied to the astrologer, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut to pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive the, from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. So here are all the wise men of the king and they're brought into the king's chambers and he tells them that he wants them to tell him what he had dreamed because he was so upsetting to him. And they say unto him, O king, we can't do this. You're asking us to do something impossible, but, but if you would tell us what the dream is, then we can give you the interpretation. Hello? Well, then the king replies to them. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will tell you, I'll, I will know that you can interpret it for me. So what is the king coming to? He's coming to the realization that these sorcerers, these astrologers, these enchanters, are doing nothing but lying to him in hoping that their interpretation of whatever these dreams had been in the past, that it would be the way to come true, that they had no supernatural powers at this point to be able to tell him what these dreams were. And he feels like he has been misled by these sorcerers and uh, encanters and magic magicians Listen, I want to tell you something. You know, on the way, on Highway 19 North, going from Meridian, on the left-hand side of the road on top of the hill, you know where I'm talking about, there's a little fortune teller that lives there on the side of the dialed road. Now, her little house is about, uh, probably about uh, 1,200, 1,300 square feet, and she usually drives an older car, but she's got a sign on the front of her house, and she's got a light that lights up that sign at night that she can tell the future or that she can tell what's going on in your life. Excuse me. i got to get used to this. I just don't understand. If she has the power to tell the future, why don't she have a new car? Why don't she have a new house? Why don't she do a lot of things around there other than just tell folks she can interpret their future? Hello? Now, I want to tell you, I believe that just like these enchanters and these sorcerers, they could not tell the future. But I want to tell you, there are spirits of the devil. We see it in the New Testament. You remember when uh, Paul and Silas was going around and there was this girl in Philippi that kept kept saying about they were the they were Christians and they were believers in Jesus and they were showing the way. It wasn't in such a way that it was honoring these disciples. It was also, uh, almost a mockery. And you will remember that she had the power to tell the future. She had the wicked power to tell the future. And when Paul got tired of her doing that, he turns around and rebukes the spirit that is within her and she no longer had the power to interpret the future. Now then listen to me. God would never have told the children of Israel not to delve into witchcraft and sorcery and, and uh, incantations and all of these kinds of things if there were not something to it. 
do you remember with me that whenever Saul was, uh, he was about to fight his last battle and he, he had turned Samuel away from him and Samuel died and he had nobody else to turn to for a word of God. You remember where he went? He went to the witch of Endor and he, and he dressed up like a commoner and he went in and he told, asked her what to do. And she looks into her looking glass or she does whatever incantation she normally did. And then finally she saw that he was King Saul and she was afraid for her life because at this point in time, all witchcraft people were put to death. So how did she know she was King Saul? Because there was demonic activity in her life. And then the Bible says she called up Samuel. Can I ask you a question? Do you suppose this was really Samuel? Or was this an evil spirit plague Samuel? Do you know that among some of these sorcerers and encanters and some of these folks that say that they can tell the future, or there are some of these folks that say God actually speaks through them, that they will go into these uh, trances and there are voices that speak to them from the past. Do you think that's of God? I want to tell you, I believe it's of the devil, and I believe it fits right in the line with witchcraft and these sorcerers and incantations and magicians and these sorts of people. And for us to consort with those kinds of mediums is against what God has for us. Now listen to me. When we consort with those kinds of individuals, what does that do for us? It opens up our lives to be oppressed with the very spirits that these people are telling you what they're telling. Hello? So when we look at Nebuchadnezzar, he has revealed the truth about these sorcerers and encanters. He has revealed the truth that they really can't say anything supernatural because they don't have the power to do so. Now then, who is orchestrating all of this? the one who always orchestrates things. Do you remember what I said this morning? When we're faithful in the little things, what does that do for us? It builds muscles. And it makes us stronger spiritually. And when we are stronger spiritually, then there's going to come a time in the future when God is going to give us the opportunity to demonstrate that strength and give glory to God. Amen? So what is going on here is that God is setting the table. God is setting the scene. God is making all the preparations for him to be glorified and for him to be honored in one who has been faithful in all the little things so that now when he comes to the point of God using him mightily that God will be shown not only as the Jewish God but as the God of all the gods. Can we cheat just a minute? Can we cheat just a minute? You know, whenever I was a kid taking algebra, the answers were always in the back of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look toward the back of the book and see what's going on. Look at, uh, look at chapter 2 and look down there at verse 47. The Bible says, chapter 2, verse 47, Then the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. You see, here's the truth. All of these circumstances that God is putting place in place 
here with Nebuchadnezzar, he is setting the scene so that God will be honored as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. And let me tell you something. There are situations and circumstances in our lives that take place that ought to give us an opportunity to give glory to God. Amen? If we have been faithful in the little things, then we should be faithful in the many things. Can I tell you one of my failures? That I wasn't faithful this week, Friday. <sighs> we're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to take my aunt who's in the nursing home in Morton out to lunch, and we're gonna take her to Jackson to get a steak. And so she calls me about nine thirty, says, "Hal, I'm just not gonna be able to go. I don't feel like going today." And she, I said, well, okay, Aunt Bert, that, that's no problem. So Vaughn and I had already gotten up and gotten ready and everything, and so we were sitting in the living room, and I said, if you could go anywhere you wanted to go, where would you go? And she said, well, I'll, I'll just have to think about that. So we thought about it a minute, and I said, she said, where would you like to go? And I said, well, you know, I'd like to go where there are azaleas that we could see the beautiful flowers. And, you know, I think Vicksburg or Natchez has some of those beautiful flowers, those azaleas in the springtime. And so we decided, a wild hair, that we would just get up, and since we didn't have anything else to do, retired as we are, happily retired, we would just travel to Vicksburg, Mississippi. And on our way, we decided we would buy one of those tours that you could go on and see some of the old houses and see some other stuff. So we get there, and... Uh, we get on the van, and so they take us. The first place we go to is the place called the, the uh, Vicksburg Hotel. This Vicksburg Hotel was built in 18-something or other, like 1840, 1850. And so this guy's taking us around the place and showing us and telling us all about, the, all about what went on in this hotel and that kind of thing. And... Uh, so then he says, now, look, he says, we have, you can go on the roof of this building and you can see the city because it's the tallest building in the city of Vicksburg. We can go on the top of this building. You can see all the city of Vicksburg. You can see the flooded river down there and the American Duchess that was American Express steamship paddle boat thing that was parked out there. You can see all that. And we said, okay, we want to go. Well, there were some other folks that wanted to go. There were about 12 of us on that, uh, on that elevator. So we get on that elevator, and it's kind of close quarters. And so this is kind of an elderly man, and I don't know, there, were, there was a little uh, number thing up here, you know, like your phone, like the old phone, you know, that touchstone phones. And then down here, there were the floors that were listed there. So he goes up there on that thing and he just punches a bunch of numbers. I guess he knew where he was going. And then he started punching buttons down here and we were gonna, supposed to go up to the 11th floor and we're going to walk up another floor. Well, when he punched that final button, it started going up. And we didn't get to the second floor before that thing stopped. I mean, it just stopped. And so we're thinking, oh, <laughs> oh, we're stuck in an elevator, and but of course there's a fan in there, so it's blowing air in, and we're kind of frivolous. You know, one of my friends, I put it on Facebook, one of my friends said, Brother Hal, that was a good time for you to preach a short sermon. And I thought, you know, that probably is true. And so there was a, while we were in that elevator, you know, I should have taken time to say something about Jesus and about the fact that he knows where we are and I want to ask him to help us to get out of this thing. But I never said a word. <laughs> so maybe my muscles weren't as strong as I thought they were. <laughs> so 
Lord, I confess my sin that I didn't do exactly maybe what I should have done, and that was a fact of give you honor and praise for a word and then ask you to open. We, we, we were in there for about 20 minutes, and uh, we were packed kind of tight. And so finally we got the elevator door open, and then there was a door to the outside, and we were about that far from the second floor, so we didn't go far at all. And so we were about that far from the second floor, and we were trying to open that door. That door wouldn't open. So he calls this guy, and the maintenance man, and, and he's got to find the key. And we said, how often has this happened? He said, I don't ever remember happening before. So if you have a key, and you hadn't used it in a very long time, do you know right where it is? <laughs> So this little lady that didn't go with us on the elevator, she said he was going up and down that stairs trying to find that key. But guess what? He finally found it. And when he found it, he opened the door. And like I said, there was about this far, and we had to crawl out of that thing. And uh, so why I told you that, I don't know. But I'm just repenting of my sin. <laughs> that I didn't give God glory or pray or something or other in Jesus' name that would have pointed all of us to him. I guess we just didn't feel like I got uh, really that desperate yet. <laughs> Lord, help me. Don't make me nervous and desperate. Okay. So anyway, so what's going on? Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream, and he doesn't know what he's dreamed calls his, his people in, his wise men in, and they can't tell him what he's dreamed. He gets mad at them, and he said, I'm going to chop you to pieces, and I'm going to burn your house down, and I'm going to kill all your people. That's just it. If you can't tell me what this is, you have had it. And then they ask him to give him more time, and he says, no, I'm not going to do it. You're just asking me to give him more time so you can think up something that can tell me that's misleading and like that. So, then the encanters, the astrologers, say in verse 10, the astrologers answered the king, there is no man on earth who can do what the king asked. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magicians or encanters or astrologer. What the king asked is too difficult. Is that true? Yes. It is true for any human being to do what he has asking them to do. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. So the king is furious, and he orders the execution to take place of all these men. Well, guess what? When we look back in the first chapter, what could Daniel do? At the very end of the first chapter, what could Daniel do? What does it say that Daniel could do? He could interpret dreams. So here we go. The wise men of that day of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon could not interpret or give the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. So what happens is that Daniel finds out about this and he goes to Ariok. Remember Ariok? Ariok was the one that uh, Daniel had found favor in his eyes and allowed him not to eat of the... Uh, of the king's table and drink of the king's wine so that he could eat vegetables and so they could be better than the ones who did. And so Ariok hears what Daniel is saying. Daniel says, let me go see the king and maybe God will bless me and I'll be able to give the interpretation. So Ariok goes and tells the king that Daniel, is he thinks, may be able to give the interpretation. So the Bible says that Daniel goes into the king. Look at verse, uh, verse 14. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Ariok then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision 
Then Daniel praised God of heaven and said, and look, look at me just a second. Did Daniel say, I can give you the interpretation? Daniel said, my God can give us the interpretation. And he said, remember what he told the, uh, his wise men? You're just, trying to, you're just trying to make time so that you can have something else going on. So what does Daniel ask? He says, give me some time that I might seek the Lord and he will tell me this, minis this mystery. So what does Daniel do? Daniel does what every one of us always do when we're in trouble. We pray. We not only pray, but what do we do? We get some folks to pray with us. So what does Daniel do? Daniel goes back and he gets together those three Hebrew boys and they cry out to God that, listen to, listen to what he says, that God would have mercy on them. Did they demand it from God? Did they sound like they were worthy that God would give them this mystery because they were obedient to God? Because of all they've done for God, surely God should honor them by giving them this. No, what they did was, God be merciful unto us. Now, you know what? How many of us deserve good things? How many of us deserve good things? The Bible says that we're all sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that if we got what we deserved, we would receive what? Death and hell. So everything that God does for us, it is not because we deserve God to do anything for us. It is because God is a merciful God and that he will give to us that which we need, not because we deserve it, but because he is merciful. And so Daniel and his friends come to God in the right way and said, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And do you know what? Whenever I pray for folks in the hospital who are very sick, I, don't, I, don't, I ask God to be merciful unto us. Be merciful unto them and provide to them that which they need, whether it be physical healing or, or whatever else that there might be done in procedures because it is according to the mercy of God that he does or blesses us. So what happens is when Daniel goes to bed, he didn't have a hard time going to sleep. Hello? He didn't have a restless soul. Why? Because he'd given it to God. And he believed that God was going to answer. However, God would answer. And that night, in his sleep, God gave to him the mystery. Now then, we're going to finish up tonight with this little part of what Daniel does in response to the mercy that God had given him and the mystery that he had seen. Listen to this. Listen to this praise note. Praise worthy. Uh, it says, Praise be to the name of, of God forever and Ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and disposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. And all the people said, Amen. When we looked at the Lord's Prayer a few weeks ago, how did it start out? It started out with praise to God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, glorified, worship, to be honored, to be complimented. And then it ends up, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So here what Daniel has done, he not only cried out for mercy with a 
Hebrew boy, there three Hebrew boys. But then whenever God answered the prayer and gave him the mystery, he gave praise unto God, recognizing who God is and what God is able to do. And all the people said, Amen. Now then, what is God preparing us for? I don't know. What is God preparing us for? In that he has given us a word that tribulation comes, the solicitation of evil comes, one comes to help us to grow, one comes to destroy us. We know that God sends these troubles and trials into our, allows them to come into our life to produce muscle. And sometimes he allows them to come to show his muscle off to bring glory unto his name. Daniel had exercised his spiritual muscle and now he was ready to be used of God to bring glory and honor to the one who is king of kings and as Nebuchadnezzar says, Lord of lords. So, what's going to happen in our life? What's going to happen in our life this week that will bring honor and glory to God? I don't know. But let's be ready. You want to? Let's be ready. Don't lose this tonight. Don't not think about this this week. That when that trouble comes or whenever that testing comes that we don't forget that God is in the midst of all these things and he's working them for his good yay God is good any word before we go